Hello, I'm Robert Ellsberg. I'm the publisher of Orbis Books, and I'm very happy to be here today with one of our uh, best-selling uh, authors, Sister Ilia Delio, uh, to talk about her new book, uh, Reenchanting the Earth, Why AI Needs Religion. Sister Ilia is a Franciscan sister of Washington, D.C. She's also a trained scientist and theologian who currently holds the Josephine C. Connolly Endowed Chair in Theology at Villanova University. She's also the founder of the Center for Cosmogenesis. And she's the author of many Orbis books, uh, including uh, my favorite, which we published last year, her memoir, uh, Birth of a Dancing Star, My Journey from Cradle Catholic to Cyborg Christian, which might be a great place for uh, new readers to begin. Building on the foundation of the great Pierre, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, she has explored the intersection between religion and science with particular interest in the insights that we are living in an evolving universe and the implications that holds for Christian faith. So Ilya, let's talk about your new book, beginning with the title, maybe, Reenchanting the Earth. When did the Earth become de-enchanted, disenchanted, and why do we need to re-enchant it again? What does, what does that mean? Yeah, right. So, you know, um, I think with the rise of modern science and the rise of modern philosophy, uh, you know, in 16th and 17th centuries, we began to uh, treat the earth as just a material object. <clears throat> and then, you know, in the 18th and 19th centuries with the building up of cities and then the advent of industrialization, um, we became further and further removed from the earth, we became very mental people, <clears throat> mental, not mentally <laughs> ill, just mental, um, you know, following the uh, turn in philosophy, the turn to the subject and the rise of Cartesian philosophy. Um, and so we began to live out of our heads, you know, and that kind of what we might call platonic thinking, you know, where the idea is more important than the reality really led to this kind of um, disconnect between ourselves um, and the earth. And, and I, I know today there's so many discussions now around disenchantment um, <clears throat> that have led in a sense to the crisis we're in in terms of the global warming crisis. And so, you know, one of the objects of the book was, um, you know, well, two objects. One, why do we not pay attention to the earth? Uh, and uh, certainly not as much attention as we do to technology. Uh, you know, the latest iPhone comes out and we're all lined up to buy it. Mm. But, you know, the latest data comes out on the earth and we're really not reading about it. We're not that interested. <clears throat> and so it really led to the question, well, what, what is it about technology that really pulls us in? You know, like we have to have the latest, the most efficient, the fastest. Um, and why are we not so enamored of, you know, reducing our carbon emissions and reducing global warming? And so that, in a, in a sense, is the background of this exploration in this book, um, the lore of technology and the way it has uh, evolved us very rapidly in the, from the mid 20th century on. And in a sense, you know, uh, the trajectories of uh, technology today and the way it's changing human personhood and the need to really bring religion, in a sense, into a new relationship. Uh, with a technological world. Hmm. <clears throat> AI, of course, refers to artificial intelligence. Could you talk a little bit about the role right. that plays in our lives today and, sure. and, and what it might mean for the future? Yeah, so, you know, um, artificial intelligence is a fascinating field. I'm co-teaching a doctoral seminar now on transhumanism, posthumanism, and the new materialisms. And just last evening, we had a very fine lecture on information. Um, and, you know, it really comes out of the discoveries of um, quantum physics, you know, in the early 20th century, uh, the rise of information theory uh, by Claude Shannon and others, uh, the discovery of systems that, you know, um, life does not work as discrete little objects, like one cell says to the other cell, gee, I think we should hook up. Rather, it works like as a system. And so systems thinking became really important in the early 20th century, which led to um, Norbert Wiener, you know, developing the science of cybernetics. And in 1946, there was a gathering of these key thinkers, Norbert Wiener, 
um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Warren McCulloch as a neuroscientist, um, Claude Shannon, Margaret Mead, Gregory Bateson. These were, these were the leading thinkers of the 20th century. And the, the gathering was called the Macy Conference. And that's, that conference, I think, is axial for the 20th century. That's where, in a sense, um, information and cybernetics began to really um, enter into kind of a mainstream of shifting the way we think about matter. And that's really what's at stake with artificial intelligence. It's how we think about m material objects. And so Alan Turing, you know, in 1950, developed uh, what was called the Turing test. Uh, could a computer uh, think like a person? Uh, now, we've had computers for a long time <clears throat> in terms of number machines, you know, a computer that can, you know, kind of uh, me mechanistically compute numbers. But this was different. This was, in a sense, the next step, taking that computer machine and saying, can you answer this question, you know, in the same way that a human would answer it? That was a milestone. <clears throat> and that's the development, in a sense, of what we're calling today artificial intelligence. And, that, and therefore, it raises the question. The, the term was coined in 1956 by McCarthy. And it raises the question, is artificial intelligence, <clears throat> excuse me, an extension <clears throat> of our intelligence into a machine? Or is the machine like a prosthetic? Does it, you know, does it add on to what we are? Um, and that's a big, it's become a big philosophical debate today. In any event, artificial intelligence is in my view, biologically extended intelligence. And by intelligence, that's a big word here, right? What do we mean by intelligence? <clears throat> it's information. So, uh, you know, big question is, does the machine, is it conscious? You know, does it know that it's answering this question? And, um, you know, as far as we can say at this point, no, but it can answer it in, in the way that it would mimic almost consciousness. So it's a really fascinating development. And of course, you know, the advent of artificial intelligence and technology has given rise to a whole new cosmology of cyberspace, you know, a whole new field of, of exploration in the infinite possibilities of information. And that's very alluring to us. How does that connect with, with the idea of kind of the cyborg and the kind of integration between the human being and Yes. Okay. Right. So the cyborg. So what we're talking about here uh, in terms of artificial intelligence and technology is that science really opened to us, opened up to us new understandings of matter. I think for, for a long, long time, we had Aristotelian biology. You know, we had matter in form. <laughs> um, now we began to realize in the 20th century that matter is more like a realm of possibilities, you know, in interconnected fields of energy uh, where there's a role for the conscious observer in this field of energy. Um, and therefore the rise of quantum physics, the rise of systems biology, uh, the rise of artificial intelligence goes hand in hand with the rise of the cyborg. The cyborg emerged in 1960 when two scientists, Kleins and Klein, um, were really, um, exploring how we could send someone into space, you know, going to Mars in a space shuttle and keep them going as a human person. So, you know, we had to strap, you know, things to them like oxygen tanks and, you know, things that would keep their muscles moving. And so the cyborg is, is a, an abbreviation for cybernetic organism. It's any organism whose physiological function is aided or controlled by electronic or mechanical devices. So the cyborg became a symbol of, hey, we're not fixed, you know, we're not fixed human persons. Like we can, like our boundaries can, you know, change. We can be strapped to a machine and that could really, all. it doesn't alter what we are essentially, but it kind of expands what we are, you know. So Donna mm -hmm. Haraway, um, the social theorist in 1985, you know, she wrote this famous work called the Cyborg Manifesto, where she saw the cyborg as symbol of a type of human person that was no longer fixed or defined by boundaries. What's interesting is the cyborg, um, Donna Haraway, uh, in particular in the cyborg as a symbol, really became symbolic for feminist thinkers, uh, theologians and philosophers, 
who thought, you know, um, gender, for example, or, or sex is not, you know, biologically determined. We're not fixed, you know, in what we are, that our boundaries can change. And, and so I think cyborg thinking has given rise to a whole new understanding of materiality. Uh, that materiality is something that's not given, it's something that's constructed in and through relationships. And that is really shifting how we think about ourselves um, as persons. How, how does that relate to the process of evolution? Well, I think in, in this respect, evolution, I take descriptively as the unfolding of life towards greater complexity or greater degrees um, of relationality. Um, you know, Teilhard de Chardin's notion of evolution was the rise of consciousness. And there's something about matter that has an openness to it towards increasing levels of complexity or increasing levels of evolution and increasing levels of consciousness. It just has this built-in openness to it. And so I think uh, the cyborg and the new materialisms uh, just sort of signal the next level of evolution that we are now in. Uh, we're in a, um, a fast moving, I think, epoch of evolution. Um, our levels of consciousness have really shifted in the late 20th century. Our notion of personhood is shifted and we see that in the way we now think about gender or um, race or being even interrelated. The internet has really ushered in a whole new level of global consciousness, you know, that we, I never had growing up in New Jersey in 19, you know, 68. I didn't even know there was anyone out besides outside New Jersey. So, so it's really fascinating, you know, that we have developed, you know, um, ways of expanding information. We have developed ways of merging with the systems of information we build. And that merging is forming a new level of complex relationality that's changing the way we think about ourselves and the way we think about the world and one another. Well, how does that um, relate to kind of traditional religious ways of thinking? And, and does our religious consciousness have to also evolve in some way to harness or adapt to this new kind of Reality. Right. Now, it's a great question, right? And that's sort of the heart of the book. And it's um, insofar as I think uh, religion, you know, traditional theology, it really, um, let's just say it has not kept up with modern science to the degree that it could have or should have. Uh, even our language about um, personhood or being. I mean, the official language of the church is, you know, we're constituted of body and soul. We're created in the image of God, made of body and soul. Body being, you know, um, uh, a substance, uh, a hylomorphic substance that can have many different forms to it. Uh, the soul being the immaterial core of the person having its own distinct form. So this language of substance and form and body and soul uh, to describe the person belongs to another era, I think. It's not, it's not in, uh, shall we say, it's not uh, aware of the new materialisms or the way you know, we can now re reconsider or reconstruct the human person as a being in evolution. And there's something about religion, you know, especially the fact that we're created in the image of God, um, you know, we make ourselves the end point of religion, like, ta-da, we're it. <laughs> when in fact, you know, if we step back and look at the sweep of things, no, we're not it. We are, in a sense, a species in evolution. That's mm -hmm. our reality. It's, and we have to understand, I think we have to rethink what this image of God concept is and, and even the notion of God in this world of ongoing evolution. Mm. You, you write about the axial age that was the time that kind of gave uh, birth to most of the great world religions and you talk about what kind of consciousness went along with that. Um, some things were gained, some things were lost, uh, and that now we are perhaps on the uh, verge of a second axial age. Uh, you want to say a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. So I use the the notion of the axial age as like a heuristic, like a framework to kind of be able to pull a lot of things together in this book. 
So a term axial age was coined by the German philosopher Karl Jaspers in 1949 in his book, The Origin and Goal of History. And um, what Jaspers noted was that within this certain time frame, which he identifies between around roughly 800 and 200 BCE, there was a breakthrough in consciousness, so to speak, throughout all the major parts of the world. Um, insofar as there was a sense of the human person as person, as individual, uh, there was a sense of uh, a, a human freedom, there was a sense of transcendence. Like this is the period of time where all the major religions sort of emerged, beginning with the oldest religion, such as Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, Jainism, and then moving into the monotheistic phase, such as um, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All of them, you know, posit some kind of solitary transcendence. You know, in the monotheistic phase, we have the prophet of Judaism, we have the monk of Christianity, um, we have the sannyasi of Hinduism and uh, the Sufi of Islam, you know, so very interesting. It's, it's, it's like a pattern, you know, and yet what, you know, what I just briefly talk about is prior to the axial age, there was a pre-axial consciousness. Um, mm -hmm. And that pre-axial consciousness was a consciousness that was not of the individual, but of the community. What, which is still around today in, you know, primal spiritualities that one wouldn't think of one's identity apart from the community. And that, that level of consciousness was um, an awareness that uh, the divine, you know, or the spirits within uh, the sky, within nature, within the trees, uh, and within the earth was the same spirit flowing through me and flowing through my community. So this kind of uh, spiritual, anim <clears throat> spiritual animism, uh, and tribal, tribalism, community, uh, were more typical of axial consciousness. What is nice about pre-axial consciousness, pre consciousness is that there was this very close association between heaven and earth, between the you know, macrocosm and the microcosm, like all one cosmic whole. That was really um, <clears throat> kind of the beginning of the great divorce became with axial consciousness, which reaches its peak, of course, in uh, the rise of Western philosophy, Western science, and the institutionalization of, of religion. Um, we're in a second axial age, and that, that term was coined both by Thomas Berry and Ewart Cousins. It's Ewart, really, I think, who uh, spelled out the second axial period in more detail um, in his book, Christ of the Second of the um, Christ of the 21st Century, was his 1992 book. And there he says, you know, look, at the beginning of the 20th century, we have a new consciousness ushering in. Uh, we send a person to the moon and we could take a, a shot from the moon back to the earth and see we're all one globe. That's a new level of consciousness of thinking about ourselves here. Um, ecology became, you know, uh, became a word that we began to hear more about. Um, prior to the 20th century, I don't think anyone really talked about ecology, you know, this household of relationships. Of course, in the mid 20th century, we had the death of God movement. But, you know, as Charles Taylor would say, God didn't so much die as God was sort of rewired, you know, kind of a new social imaginary of the imminence of spirituality. Um, and so what Ewart says is that uh, the move towards a new consciousness of community, of uh, belonging to a globe, of uh, world religions. He says, this, these are signs of a new axial age of consciousness. And all I do in my book is just kind of build on that and say, yeah, the internet is actually advancing second axial period consciousness. We know ourselves now to belong to a globe, a planet. Um, and I think it would be very rare to have someone who says, what, there's a planet out there, you know, um, who would only think of themselves within their own particular neighborhood. So we're, we, we have definitely undergone a major shift in consciousness in the late 20th century, and uh, we haven't been prepared for it. I think one of the things, I don't think I mentioned this too much in the book, but I kind of allude to it. We have not been prepared for the information explosion of the late 20th century and the rapid rise of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And we don't know what to do, how, how to cope with it, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. Well, your subtitle says, Why AI Needs Religion. Uh, what does AI have to gain from religion? 
Yes. So it's it's precisely that insofar as um, and here, you know, uh, I, I'm thinking of the transhumanists, uh, such as Ray Kurzweil uh, and Max Moor and um, Hans Moravec and others who really have utopic dreams with AI of, you know, brain downloading, overcoming the digital divide of death. I mean, rather than rather uh, overcoming the divide of death or the death barrier and towards digital immortality, mm. um, this kind of human enhancement where we'll become per more perfect beings, which, you know, um, a lot of AI, uh, and this is Robert Gerasi's work, is rooted in the Judeo-Christian tradition. And basically it says, look, religion has failed. You know, Christianity promised salvation, immortality and happiness, and look where it's gotten us. You know, we have wars and violence. And so, you know, they're saying we can now create immortality. We can make um, ourselves in a sense happier by perfecting what we are. And I think that's a, you know, that's a false, first of all, it's a very narrow understanding of religion. I think it's building on false hopes. Um, because I think it doesn't adequately interpret what the New Testament is about. Um, and I do think post-humanism has a better um, chance or better openness to the possibilities of a new religious spirit or a new type of spirituality. Mm -hmm. Without religion, without a revival or renewed sense of religious spirit, I do think uh, we could find ourselves in a very strange world with AI, a world where the gaps may get even wider, where, you know, we'll have a greater elite of eugenic people, you know, people who are perf perfected in their intelligence and their looks, and a lot more people left out if they cannot afford that technology. We'll have a smaller number of people living on indefinitely at the expense of many others. So I think, you know, you know, in my view, a healthy dose of Christianity or religion, you know, in its aims for, uh, for justice, for compassion, um, for a world of unity, you know, for a world that, that we do, do become a body, the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, I think if, it, if religion can align itself or can find itself in a new way uh, with AI, it holds much promise for the, de for the development of technology. Otherwise, we're on a blind trajectory with technology. And, um, and I'll tell you, quite honestly, the consumer hasn't a clue of what they're buying into. You know, uh, big business has a lot of, lot of goals of where, where we sh what we should be in the future. So it needs to slow down and we need to catch up with it in terms of the religious dimension of our lives. Well, uh, I think you've given a pretty good idea of what's in this book and, and anyone who reads it will. Uh, see reflected that kind of crackling in, intelligence and brilliance and and uh, ideas uh, from coming from every direction. And once you've uh, delved into Ilya Delia's books, I, you don't really ever see anything the same way again. So we're all becoming us, uh, joining you, becoming cyborg Christians. I hope. Anyway, thank you very much, Ilya. Her book is Reenchanting the Earth: Why AI Needs Religion, available from Orbis Books. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert.